So in this lecture series of endocrinology, I'll be talking about the pituitary disorder, specifically diabetes insipidus and acromegaly. So I'll start with diabetes insipidus. What is diabetes insipidus? What do we understand from this term? Basically, it's a condition in which the kidneys are unable to concentrate urine. What this does is that it causes our body to make a lot of diluted urine that is insipid, meaning it is colorless and odorless. It also causes the person to feel extremely thirsty. In diabetes insipidus, the amount that a person will urinate varies somewhere between 3 liters to 20 liters per day. This leads to an imbalance of fluids in the body. Before moving further, I would like to talk about the antidiuretic hormone which plays the most important role in diabetes insipidus. It's uh, basically produced in the hypothalamus and stored in the posterior pituitary gland. Now, what it does is that uh, in a normal healthy person, when your bodily fluids are depleted or like for example you're dehydrated, the ADH will be released from the pituitary gland and it will act on the kidneys to increase the water uh, permeability in the collecting duct and the distal convoluted tubule so that it reabsorbs more water and it uh, reduces the urine volume and it increases its concentration. So as you can see, the hypothalamus has these osmoreceptors which sense the osmolality, which is basically the concentration of dissolved particles, the major ones being glucose, sodium, and blood urea nitrogen. Now when you're dehydrated or there's a depletion of bodily fluids, the osmolality obviously increases, and the osmoreceptors detect that, and they all, through the thirst mechanism, they increase water consumption as well as they stimulate the release of ADH into the bloodstream. Okay, here you can see the different types of diabetes insipidus. The most common type and also the main focus of this presentation is the central form. In central diabetes insipidus, what happens is that your hypothalamus doesn't produce enough uh, ADH and this leads to a lack of the hormone. When there is a lack of uh, ADH, your posterior pituitary doesn't have enough of it and it cannot release it in times of need. In the nephrogenic form, your hypothalamus is working perfectly fine. Uh, your posterior pituitary is releasing enough ADH, but your kidneys are not responsive to it. They don't respond to the hormone and they cannot retain the water. In the dipsogenic form, this is not related to ADH, but it's related to the thirst mechanism in your hypothalamus. When that is damaged, you don't know when you're thirsty and you intake excessive. So in no particular order, these are the various mechanisms by which we can have insufficient ADH production. Um, for example, congenital disorders or just uh, genetic defects in hormone production. Tumors such as adenoma or meningioma can cause pressure in the hypothalamic pituitary region. We have iatrogenic causes uh, such as during surgery there could be damage to the hypothalamus or the pituitary gland. Autoimmune uh, where there is destruction of the hormone producing nuclei. Then we have inflammation, hemorrhage, trauma. And in 45% of the cases, diabetes insipidus centralis has, is just idiopathic. There is no cause to it.
Uh, acromegaly is a hormonal disorder which uh, develops when our pituitary gland produces too much growth hormone during adulthood. When we have too much growth hormone, our bones will increase in size. In childhood, this leads to increase in height and is called gigantism. But in adulthood, a change in height will not occur. Instead, the increase in bone size is limited to the hands, feet and face and it is called acromegaly. So in the simplified version of a flow chart, you can see that the hypothalamus will produce growth hormone releasing hormone, which targets the anterior pituitary, which produces growth hormone. The growth hormone will target the body cells such as the liver cells to produce insulin-like growth factor 1. Insulin-like growth factor 1 uh, is basically a hormone that will bind to IGF-1 and insulin receptors and it has a proliferative effect on cartilage, skeletal muscle, bone, skin, soft tissue and organs. It also causes impaired glucose tolerance caused by binding to insulin receptors. Too much growth hormone leads to too much insulin-like growth factor 1 which can cause acromegaly signs, symptoms and complications. So now let's look at the skeletal effects of acromegaly. The patient will have an enlarged nose, forehead and jaw and they will have widened hands, fingers and feet. They will also have painful arthropathy in the ankles, knees, hips and spine. So soft tissue effects of acromegaly will present itself with doughy skin texture, hyperhidrosis due to increase in the sweat gland size, deepening of the voice, macroglossia with fissures, wider spacing between the teeth and protrusion of the lower jaw. So if left untreated, acromegaly can cause major health problems which can lead to premature death. Uh, cardiovascular complications being one of the most common. Hypertension will occur in 30% of the cases. Uh, there is also left ventricular hypertrophy, cardiomyopathy, arrhythmias and valvular disease. Impaired glucose tolerance and diabetes mellitus will occur in up to 50% of the cases. It increases the risk of colorectal polyps and cancer and increases the risk of thyroid enlargement and cancer as well. It can lead to cerebral aneurysm as well as vision changes or vision loss. So how do we diagnose acromegaly? If clinical signs of acromegaly are present, we will do a hormone analysis of serum insulin-like growth factor 1. If the levels are normal, we will exclude acromegaly. But if it is elevated, we will do an oral glucose tolerance test plus growth hormone measurement. Now, if the growth hormone is suppressed two hours after glucose ingestion, we will exclude acromegaly. But if it is not, then it is confirmed acromegaly. We will then perform a pituitary MRI to make sure if there is a visible mass. And if there is a visible mass, then it is a growth hormone secreting pituitary adenoma. But if it is normal, we will screen for extra pituitary causes.